welcome everyone. Fun to, to see so many people filling out the room. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can create our own f PowerShell modules in C Sharp. And at the basic level, we're going to help you create your first one if you haven't. Before we get into it, uh, I'd like to throw a huge thanks to our sponsors who are letting us be here and making this great event happen. Uh, everyone involved in organizing and sponsoring this event, just huge thank you. Very much so, thank you. This is us. <laughs> we met for the first time last year uh, at PSConf, and we haven't met since. Uh, why are we here together on stage? Uh, I'm pretty sure I saw that you wanted to do this kind of follow along thing, and I was like, hey, can I like jump on your back and like ride? I want to try this too. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so uh, this started uh, when the uh, presentations got announced and uh, we saw this and we were like, hey, this seems like a fun thing to maybe try to do together. This is a new format, this follow along, if you, this is your first PSCon for you. Uh, stuff's going to break, stuff's going to be wild, we're trying this, we're going to see how it goes. It's going to be a blast, we're all going to have a good time though. Yep. And so, um, yeah, we've been working on this presentation just over Zoom. You know, I live in the US, he lives in Sweden, and so, you know, I'm up at... I'm up at, when am I up at? I don't even remember. Anymore. You're up no. at 6, I'm at 10 p.m. Yeah. You're up at 6 a.m. Right? So it's been, uh, been it's, fun. Yeah, I've been doing that for about the last, uh, what, six, three? Six months? Six months? Has it been I that think, long? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, time, so we worked together plus. on this presentation, just completely different time zones, and here we are, and had a couple uh, shots of uh, Jakob's uh, plum whiskey before, and we'll see how that helps. <laughs> so, uh, who are you, Justin? That's a very existential question. Yeah. Uh, who okay. am I? Uh, my name is Justin Grody. I'm a data center solutions architect with Allied Digital. Um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP. Um, been working with PowerShell a while. Love it. It's pretty much all you need to know. Yes, Rob. I haven't gotten. I'm not there yet. This is just me. This is no content. This is just filler. You know. Yeah. And uh, I'm Emmanuel Palm. I work at uh, Knowledge Factory at Adalia Sweden, and I do Azure stuff and love working with PowerShell. And I have a background in C Sharp, which is how I found PowerShell. And now I'm kind of finding my way between the two languages. Today, what are we talking about? Uh, today we're going to give you a real intro into developing PowerShell modules with C Sharp. Um, PowerShell is basically written in C Sharp. If you can go out to GitHub, look at PowerShell repo, and you can see Everything, every commandlet and such that you know is pretty much written in C-sharp at that level. Um, there's a variety of tooling options as a result because C-sharp is, you know, for better or worse, the most dominant language in the .NET ecosystem. And so uh, as a result, it has a huge following and there's a lot of different ways to manage that. We're going to go through a lot, a lot of your options are. And of course, today is a follow along session. So in this process, if you are able to uh, get on and everything, um, you'll be using GitHub code spaces where we'll have a pre-configured environment ready to go for you. And in there, you'll be um, learning the anatomy of a C-sharp project, what all the different weird files mean and why they're there. Um, you'll be building uh, examples that we have and publishing them and testing them. And we'll go through all those examples. And then at the end, we'll also have uh, labs that you can complete. And we have pester tests ready to go that if you are able to complete the lab, you can pull request. And if your pester test passed, then great, congratulations, you finished the lab. So that's pretty much what we're going through today, and we'll see how it goes. Again, there's the QR code for the repository. This is the same one linked from out front. The setup instructions are there. The instructions are basically just um, sign up for a GitHub account, go to the repo, click create code space. Um, we had some instructions, a uh, minor note, um, we had some instructions about going to the extra and needing to change it to four cores for a better experience. Uh, we changed the repository so that it just forces you to have four cores. Because a, a certain somebody told me that like, oh, I like your repository, I want to come to your presentation, but it's so slow, it's so slow. So we fixed that <laughs> issue. So if you go and just go in and just click the big green create code spaces button, you should be good to go. Yeah. Um, you might get a few pop-ups, that kind of thing, reload. We'll go through all that, but we'll get there, so. And if you don't want to go to the code space or um, GitHub immediately because it's a long URL, you can go to the psconf.eu slash 2023 and there's a follow along link session thing, yep. uh, which leads to the same one. So, so this is, you know, this will be fun, but I mean, why are we doing this? I mean, yeah. like I know how to write an advanced function. I like it works for me. Like, why would I want to learn this whole other language that has all these weird curly braces and, and symbols and all that kind of stuff? Like, what's the benefit to me? That's, that's what we care about. Great question. Why, why do I care? Why do we care? Um, 
by using C-sharp, we can leverage a lot of the .NET ecosystem. Justin mentioned how it's C-sharp is like the primary .NET language, and it's been around for longer than PowerShell. It has a lot of tooling, a lot of stuff, and most, I would say, .NET packages called NuGet packages are published mainly for C-sharp, not maybe built as PowerShell modules. Uh, and most of the modules out there that are built in C-sharp are often wrapping one or more NuGet packages. So if we can learn to do the same, we can leverage a lot of the functionality that is already out there. And that comes in many ways, but it lets us implement a lot of things in a more robust way by leveraging .NET features that are not yet or are not available in PowerShell. We have stuff like type safety, where in C Sharp you have to define what type a variable is, what type a method, think of it as a function belonging to a member or something, will return. So we can say we want a string back from this, we want an integer back from this. We also have access to generic methods and interfaces and things that are maybe more advanced, but we don't always have to use them. And you can do this in PowerShell too. There are ways to kind of get around this and do this, but it's not pretty and it's not fun. It's not pretty. Um, so we want to do this in C Sharp, most of the cases, when we get the opportunity or um, see a use case for it. Some useful scenarios. Um, that I like is interacting with SDKs that are already available. So if we have a new product or we're working with like Azure or Microsoft Graph or stuff, uh, Microsoft Graph is a bad example because there's a good PowerShell module, but we have other client libraries that are um, published for certain parts of Azure products, like the storage tables, for example, that I built a module around we can wrap those in binary modules. And overall, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So if there's functionality out there, we can use it if it's .NET. Do you have any good examples of modules that are using C Sharp? I got a few. So I mean, one that you probably know pretty well is Pester. Um, Pester, especially in the more recent versions, has increasingly used C Sharp more and more to kind of provide a much more structured model to how they handle like what a test looks like and be able to model the data in a very type safe way that allows them to catch a lot of errors as they write it rather than finding out at runtime or at the test time and allows them to be a little much more performance. So just sometimes you don't have to rewrite the whole thing. Pester is still a large chunk of written in PowerShell, but sometimes there's maybe just like a little piece that you need to be really fast or you need it to be really reliable. And so that's a good time where a good scenario where you might want to use C Sharp. Another one, we presented me and Simon, who's here. Um, yesterday, we talked about PS Bicep, a module we built in C Sharp, where we used the Bicep source code to make a PowerShell module for Bicep, which uses something called an assembly load context, which I will have a session on tomorrow at 5 um, for more advanced topics on loading assemblies and resolving conflicts. Mm -hmm. Uh, PRTG API, this may be one a lot, not a lot of you may have heard of, but this is a module that I love. Um, PRTG is a uh, product that's used for network monitoring. And um, just they don't provide an official mod module, but they have an API. And uh, this uh, just guy on GitHub, Lord Milko, who just had it for his company, uh, decided he needed something. So he first built a whole C Sharp like SDK for it so his C Sharp programs could use it. But then he realized once he had built the C Sharp part, it was really easy to just layer in PowerShell commandlets to interact with that as sort of a user interface. And so as a result, like you, it's a really great example of if you're not utilizing an existing SDK and you want to work from scratch, um, the structure of that module and how we wrote it, I'm, I'm continually impressed by like what that module looks like and how it's done. So that's a great example of a completely from scratch module that supports both C Sharp and PowerShell. It's a good example to look at if you're starting out. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one to look at, like how he scaffolds things out. I really, like. even though it's old and uses some older concepts, there's newer concepts that we want to do now that didn't exist when most of the stuff was written. It's really great. So, most of Microsoft's official modules have some C sharp. So, if you look into like the source code of Azure PowerShell or Microsoft Graph, there's a lot of stuff going on there um, in the GitHub repos. You have something called Mortar. Yeah, so I made a little module called Mortar, one of, of several, that this is a case of where we talk about, you know, if there's an idea that you have, somebody else has probably already had it. And so Mortar was meant to, is meant to be a replacement for Plaster, which is a templating engine for PowerShell. 
And we, with, in C Sharp, there's actually a whole templating engine built into, if you use the .NET new command, which we will talk a little bit about, um, there's a whole engine around that, and there's a whole library around that, and it's built in such a way to be portable. So I made a module that just uses that infrastructure and allows you to use .NET, that same templating engine, to make PowerShell modules and use PowerShell to interact with it. So again, another great example of taking something that was already built, saving myself a ton of time, and utilizing that rather than writing it all from scratch. Module I made called Azure Bobby Tables. There's stickers down at the bottom furthest where Bjarne is sitting, raising his hand, if someone wants them. Uh, this is the module I mentioned for storage tables, uh, wrapping a client library from Microsoft. You're holding a session about Posh Anywhere. I am, yes. So Posh Anywhere is a session that I'll be doing on, I think, tomorrow, um, hopefully. Uh, yeah. And this is an example of sometimes there's times, especially in the, in the PowerShell itself, where they, ex they expose APIs from PowerShell to allow you to do some fun stuff. And so in the most recent 7.3 release of PowerShell, they made it possible to create your own custom transport providers for remoting. So, you know, there's SSH, there's WSMAN. If you want to make your own, you can now do that. And in fact, I did that. I made one that um, supports just raw TCP connections as examples, streams, uh, web sockets, and even utilizing a thing called Cloudflare Tunnels to basically wherever your PowerShell runs, let it phone home and let you rendezvous with that to be able to interact with it and troubleshoot it. So check that out tomorrow, but this is an example that's pretty much written purely in C-sharp uh, to keep the performance done as well as leverage some of the nice things in C-sharp that are really ugly in PowerShell. So, And you're probably using more modules than you expect that are written in C-sharp already. A little bit about tooling. Yeah, so the thing about uh, C-sharp is that the tooling landscape is vast. There's lots of different options. You don't know what to get started with. Um, you know, and the thing is, is, like a lot of them have community or preview versions that you can try them out. Um, first and foremost is the .NET SDK. This is the core. The soft SDK stands for Software Development Kit. It's the core um, infrastructure that basically all these tools eventually leverage. This is, and the core of this is the .NET command, D-O-T-N-E-T. -E and you'll see that a lot when we do this and we go through the labs. You use it to do your builds. You use it to do your publishing. It's what takes that C# -sharp code and converts it into that .NET language so that it can then be utilized inside PowerShell as a DLL, as well as does tons of other stuff, but that's what we care about it for the purposes of, of this uh, pr presentation. And so you can simply just write your C-sharp code in whatever text editor you like and use this to compile it, and that may be all you need. But as you get more advanced, that's not really fun. It's not. So there's all kinds of tooling that makes that much more comfortable, much easier, in the same way as using Visual Studio Code or the PowerShell ISE, rather than just using you know, a text editor. Um, you can use PowerShell to build .NET just as well because it can interact with the .NET SDK. So you can make scripts that do your .NET build, move things around, get things packaged. Um, you can use PowerShell to build things as well as PowerShell has, um, utilizes a .NET feature called reflection. If you've ever done git member or anything like that where you're like, what is this object? What are the properties on it? It can be really helpful when you're writing code and you hit a bug to run your commandlet in the thing and then inspect the object uh, doing that in other tools that exist in C-sharp can be really painful and cumbersome. PowerShell is actually a really excellent tool for doing that. So even yeah. if you're not even writing for PowerShell, you're just writing C-sharp for C-sharp's sake, PowerShell is a great tool for interactively troubleshooting those issues that you might have. Um, any code editor, code editor in this case is just simply anything that can edit text as an example. Um, again, C-sharp is just uh, ultimately just is just a textual representation of something that gets compiled to a machine language. So whatever you want to use to edit that, you can. And you don't let anybody shame you for what you do. Um, just, just a little bit, maybe. Maybe. Well, maybe. Well, well, don't let anybody shame you, but I'm going to shame some people. So hmm. um, well, one of the main things is, so a very, very new thing is Visual Studio Code. It's actually had a C-sharp extension for a while. It's had varying degrees of quality. Um, the newest pre-release, uh, Microsoft has invested a lot into this, and it is much better. Like even if you just use the stable today, Visual Studio Code, especially with plugins like GitHub Copilot and such, is a very actually venerable C# -sharp, uh, pl place to develop C# -sharp stuff. I do all of my um, C# -sharp work in Visual Studio Code, and that's only just because I knew Visual Studio Code, and just like PowerShell. Um, PowerShell is you know, the promise of PowerShell is you know you learn it once and you know they continually get that investment. You're able to do new modules and do new things with the same interface. Visual Studio Code really delivers that same for me that same promise that once I took the time to get off uh, ISC and learn Visual Studio Code for my PowerShell stuff, now I can write Go code. Now I can write TypeScript stuff. Now I can write C# -sharp stuff, and I get the same interface. The debugging's pretty much the same. Um, it's a really nice. I don't have to relearn everything. So this is a great option. 
And very recently, like literally two weeks ago, um, they released this new piece called the C-Sharp Dev Kit, which brings a, a few extra like Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio, the full Visual Studio products um, over into Visual Studio Code. Things like a Solution Explorer, a Test Explorer. You don't need to know what any of those things mean. It's just, it brings over some features. That is, however, very new. It's in pre-release, and it does require some special licensing that you need to be aware of. So for now, our presentation, we didn't include that in this. We're just using the base C-sharp extension. That is based on a thing called OmniSharp. It's fully open source. It's totally free. Don't need to worry about any of those kind of restrictions. Um, one thing which you've probably heard over and over again is that Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio are two completely different things. Even though it's a common name, as Microsoft likes to do, like, you know, how common is Active Directory and Azure Active Directory? Like, worst naming ever. <laughs> it's like they have nothing in common, pretty much. And so Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio are, are very, very different things. And I'll let Emmanuel talk a bit about Visual Studio. Yeah, uh, Visual Studio is, is my kind of background editor. So it's what I'm using for C-sharp development. And it's more like a full-fledged programming suite of things. Uh, but VS Code has pretty much everything you need as well. So it's really up to your choice. And if you want to use another editor, there's also one called Writer, right? Yeah, so JetBrains Writer, this is a third party, you know, non-Microsoft solution, but it's extremely popular as well. Um, it's actually written in Java, but it's a very capable for writing C-sharp and F-sharp and other languages and provides a lot of functionality. It even has a component called ReSharper, which is a piece that if you like Visual Studio, but you want all the sort of refactorings and all kinds of cool tools and analysis that it does, it has a plugin that'll bring a lot of that functionality into Visual Studio. So if you're comfortable with that, you can get that add on and get sort of the best of both worlds. Um, that is a commercial product. It does have like community options available as well. Um, but just be aware that there's this whole landscape for everybody from you're just getting started to, you know, you're developing the largest pro monoliths on the planet, so. And then finally, again, as I like to say, like in the end, though, any text editor will do. Like you can write C sharp and anything you want. Just please don't use Notepad. I mean, you can. Like I say, don't let anybody shame you. But I'm going to shame you. Don't let me do it. But if you want to write in Notepad, you can. But there's so much power that you get from these editors. They help prevent you from making mistakes at the time that you write. So you know what's more important: showing off that hey, I can do this at the command line, or writing code faster, getting things done, being more productive. That's what we're all about with PowerShell. We don't care. We're all about getting it done fast and loose, so that we get an actual product delivered and we're productive over you know some ivory tower concept of how things should be. And these tools really help you focus you into that. They really help you to um, you know automatically generate code for you, let you know where your issues are, and let you know the second that you're writing something that like hey, you need to update this thing over here rather than you having to compile it, see some kind of weird error message, and then try to figure out where the problem is. So that's sort of the landscape. Today, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code because it is very compatible with a thing called Code Spaces, which allows us in GitHub to basically give you an environment. And it's free. You know, you get like, I think, 40 hours free on the four core instance that we're doing. So hopefully, you'll be able to, we won't be that long. Yeah, well, hopefully, this, this presentation won't be that long. But you will be able to do all this development, and you don't even need to have Visual Studio Code installed. You can just do it in the web browser. I implemented all of the labs that you'll see completely in the web browser. I didn't use my local Visual Studio Code at all. I just opened it in Edge and did the entire process there, and it was pretty much as if it was local. It's a great, it's a great way to do things. So that's what we're going to go through today. So um, I'm going to walk you through here real quick. Um, I, one of the baseline things here is we assume that you probably have at least an intermediate knowledge of PowerShell and you've probably written at least one function. If you haven't, that's okay, but this is, it probably isn't going to make any sense to you, but feel free to go back and get more information on that. So what I'm going to show you is that uh, how a function is implemented in PowerShell in terms of then turning it into a commandlet or an advanced function as it's known, and then what that looks like in C Sharp. So this will help you translate your concepts from one side to the other. So when you have a base setup like that, this is sort of the basic setup. On the left, Pretty simple. Everybody knows what that looks like, right? Just a function. Doesn't do anything, but we have it defined, and now we can type get example after we do that. Over on the right, a little more complicated, a little more specific. That's pretty much what you'll find in C Sharp is that everything's much more specific. Um, at the top, basically, just that you can see the get example there. Don't worry so much about like what that structure looks like, but you can just see is that we're defining get example there. But then we can also name the actual class where we're defining our commandlet. You can name that whatever you want, but as a kind of common convention, you usually do whatever the name is in either command or commandlet. I like commandlets. Most of the PowerShell repository uses command. And then that colon commandlet there that you see there simply just says this class uh, is going to borrow a lot of functionality or inherit from another, um, from another thing that's already defined, which that's already defined in PowerShell. 
So by doing that, you're just saying, you're basically getting a lot of built-in stuff for free. And so the next step you do, if you're going to make an advanced function, is that you add this funky commandlet binding thing. And again, if you don't know what that commandlet binding thing is, you just know that you put it in there, and now what if works and verbose works and all that stuff, that's fine. That's the, you don't need any more knowledge than that for this um, lab. Uh, and then you have to have a param block once you do that. So when you do it in C Sharp, you just add PS commandlet to that. And so 90% of the time when you're writing a C Sharp commandlet, you're just going to do it to PS commandlet. You just get extra functionality for free in the same way that you get when you do commandlet binding. Um, then the next thing you do is you need parameters. Whereas you know in PowerShell you can be really terse here and just do dollar name. Um, you can add all this extra stuff to be more, more specific. Like you can say, I want it to be mandatory. I want this to work on the pipeline. And then I want to make sure that whatever gets supplied, that that's a string. I always want it to be a string. And I think I put a capital there, lowercase. You know, probably should, that should probably be lowercase, but it'll be fine. So on the commandlet side, you can see it's pretty much the same. The syntax is different. If you're not used to looking at C Sharp, like it's a little weird. There's a few more brackets. Um, there's some stuff that you can do. Um, whereas on the left-hand side, doing the equals dollar true, like some you see that in a lot of examples. It's actually optional if you didn't know that. But on the C Sharp side, it's mandatory. You have to put it. And then um, the public part just simply says, hey, this is something that I want to expose. Uh, and then there's the string, just like on the left-hand side, and then the name of the variable. So like, again, so far, like, these are pretty similar. Like The concepts translate real straightforward. So then we have our begin, process, and end blocks. And if you haven't ever seen these, if you leave these out, you're implicitly having a process block. So again, if you don't understand these concepts, don't worry about it. I'm assuming most of you have seen this before. You have an idea of what these three things are. So when you do this over on the uh, commandlet side, you have begin processing, process record, and end processing. And those basically do the same thing that these do over here. Uh, and you don't have to implement them all. I just put them all here for... Uh, uh, implementation's sake, but you can pick and choose just like you can on the left-hand side. Then finally, we have the actual functionality of our code. So a real simple thing that you can do is that if somebody provides a name, then we can say hello and then in include that name. So over here, same thing, only the big difference between C-sharp commandlets and PowerShell is in PowerShell, everything that you write to the output just shows up. In C Sharp, you have to be very explicit when you want your commandlet to output stuff. You have to say write object or uh, write verbose and those kind of things using this function and then whatever you want to output. In this case, we used a string um, and this little fancy syntax is called interpolation syntax. Don't worry about that. Again, it's just a way of doing a string and substituting the name for whatever was provided. And, um, and then that's your output. But that's a key thing here is that you really want to make sure that when you output things, you have to be very explicit about it. Otherwise, if you do it like you do in PowerShell and you just like call a function and you expect that to just show up and when you run your commandlet, nothing comes out, this is why, because you didn't use write object. Conversely, this throws people who come from C Sharp to PowerShell, um, you know, because they forget this part and then stuff shows up everywhere and they're like, what's going on? So that's sort of the core of what a commandlet looks like. So we're going to get into labs. We don't want to spend too much time on this. And so, of course, we're doing a follow-along session. If you've had the chance to um, get through the setup instructions, that's great. If not, uh, we'll go through it a bit there. Um, this is on Codespaces, so we'll be online. And, of course, when I last tested this wireless in a full presentation, it was actually doing pretty good. But yep. we're going to see how this goes. It could blow up terribly, and we're just going to do everything locally. It could work great, and everybody's able to follow along. We'll see, but we're just all going to be in this together. So we'll see what happens. So again, here's the follow along. Um, again, there's the QR code again if you'd like to follow along. If, um, but if you're not, if by the way, if you're not, uh, if you're, uh, excuse me, if you're not going to follow along, you'll still see everything we're going to do. You'll probably learn something. Don't worry about it if you're not planning to follow along. We had an idea for the questions, right? So if if you have questions about what we're going through, like concept wise or something that we just showed, but you're not sure about how that worked, can we repeat that? Um, yeah. Then you can just raise a hand. But if you're completely stuck and your dev container blew up and something's going terribly wrong, then you just do this. Yeah, full, full hands up. Panic. I give up. And, and then, what we'll do is, oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. and then if the entire room is that, then we know we have a problem. But if not, what we'll, our general plan will be is that as we go through, as one person's showing part of it, um, the other one will come run down and see if we can fix your problem. And if we can, then we're going to come up and we're going to share what we learned with the class. So... Um, so that's basically the general plan that we're going to go through here. So again, this might get frustrating. This might get weird. You might get stuck. Things might happen. 
You know, you're probably going to make this face more than once. But, you know, we're all here to learn. We're all going to have a good time. And uh, we're just going to see how this goes. Great stuff. So I think we're just going to jump straight into VS Code. Yeah. So I guess, first of all, um, has, who, show of hands, who has the code space up and ready and have been able to get in? Awesome. That's great. Excellent. You may have gotten a bunch of messages, like stuff like, hey, welcome to VS Code for the first time. Here's the icons. I tried to clean up a lot of that as I could. But otherwise, if it's stuck or it's saying you need to reload, just uh, do your F1 or Control-Shift-P in Visual Studio Code, which is like the Google for v VS Code, and just type reload, and it'll come up with reload window. If you do that once, it should be fine. Um, so something that's fun to note here, if you want to work in uh, VS Code, is that you can go to your code space. Um, I've already started one, otherwise there's a green button here. Uh, and I can go to the dots and say open in Visual Studio Code. And you're going to be able to work locally and it's remote again to that dev container. Uh, which I've already done, but it stopped, so I'm going to start it here again, and it's going to yeah. reload so again, the thing. Even though this looks like your local Visual Studio code, this is just, it's remoting. If you've ever used like SSH remoting or anything like that, it's just doing that, it's that same thing, but it's running from a little virtual machine running in the GitHub data center. So this is all just running remotely. That's the key. It's going to be great because it'll look like it's running locally, but this is actually just in a VM somewhere. So Exactly. And if this is slow... Uh, because of conference Wi-Fi or because the code space stopped. It's just got to boot up, yeah. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So this is our, our container. And we have set up this uh, with a few extensions that we like. A couple of things real quick. Is that big enough? Can everybody see the good letters call. and the names of folders? Great. It's good. All right. Otherwise, we can really zoom internal, un until everyone's uncomfortable. There we go. Um, we can have it like this just to talk about the, the structure. So we have a few folders, and it might look intimidating, but a lot of it is just like scaffolding for this demo to work for all of you. So we have something called a dev container uh, folder. This one has the JSON, which is like the configuration for the dev container itself. It has all the information about which packages it should install, what extensions we want for VS Code, and we're not really going to dive into that, but you can explore that on your own. Same with uh, the GitHub folder. This one has one GitHub action. If you didn't see Bjorn's presentation yesterday, he talked about we can, how we can create those ourselves. This triggers on pull requests and will do pester tests on your potential pull requests for the labs. So you can check out how you're doing there. Uh, we have a VS Code folder that has settings for VS Code, so you don't have to set up all your debugging tasks and everything yourself. And then we have the images folder for our readme with the instructions that you might have gone through already, hopefully. Uh, as well as a few more things. We have the source folder, SRC. That's a common kind of convention of naming your things in a more programming world. And we decided to keep it that way so that potential C Sharp developers are happy. Yeah, and, and again, to be clear, like a lot of things you're going to see here, these are just sort of conventions that have evolved organically, but you don't have to do it this way. You can name it source. You can yeah. put your C Sharp files directly in the root. You can organize it pretty much however you want. Uh, just the key, Again, the key thing to think about is whenever you're writing things, you really should be thinking about who you're working with as well as who's going to have to maintain what you have when you leave. So if you go with non-standard, if it's a private project, like you look at mine, I don't do any of this stuff. I have my own way of doing things. But if I'm doing something that I expect somebody else to consume or maintain or maybe make pull requests on, I try to make it as comfortable and easy for them to get into as possible. So that's a good reason to continue to follow like these sort of standard conventions. It's sort of a standard, a de facto standardization that has occurred. But it's totally optional. So Yeah. Uh, so in there is all our code, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, we also have a tests folder, which has all our labs uh, tests for from Pester. Um, those are going to be run by you, hopefully, with Invoke Pester if you want to test your labs locally, or they're going to be run by the PR GitHub Action. We also have an editor config to make sure that all code uh, in this repo is displayed a certain way. So we have a standardized way of looking at the code and saying that we want this in Pascal case and we want this in that type of indentation. Um, it's a lot of rules and we haven't made all of them ourselves. Uh, so Yeah, in fact, uh, when I was speaking earlier, that .NET new command that I was talking about, there's a .NET new editor config that will sort of generate an initial scaffolding. That's sort of the usual default configs. And you'll get that giant file like I showed. But then you can get, at least get an idea of like what all the options are. And then you can go in there and tune and tweak and say, well, I like my braces on the new line. Or I want to make sure that 
all our private variables start with lowercase, or I don't care about this warning, like don't warn me about this, I know it's okay. You can tune and tweak all that stuff. And so what's really nice about it is then other people, like when you guys are in your code space, you're getting the rules that we define. So you don't even have to think about, oh, am I doing this to the style of the code? It'll pop up and tell you if you're not doing it to, our, to the style we're requesting. So yep. that's a really nice feature. Next up, we have a git ignore. So since it's a git repo, we can, if we want, add something called a git ignore, where we can write patterns which will ignore certain files matching those patterns. So we don't have to, um, all the DLL files that we're building, we don't really want to version control those in the Git repo because we would just want to recompile it if we want them. Um, and it takes a lot of space and it's kind of iffy to version control. So we can ignore all of those. We have a global JSON where we say that we want a certain version of the .NET SDK. Um, if this is not available, we won't work. Uh, and if we have a higher version, it's going to go back to that one and make sure that we're using the one expected. We have a license file. We have a readme with all the uh, information. And we have our PowerPoint, if you want to take a look at that and the slides later, as well as this weird file. What is this? this what looks, is that? That looks like nothing I've ever seen before. That's horrifying. That is, is that? a mess. Yeah, so this is a PowerShell, there, excuse me, this is a Visual Studio solution file. Um, what this basically is, is this is a definition of what your project looks like and then what your individual components of your project look like. So again, C Sharp, in PowerShell we tend to do things fairly simple. We write scripts, we write functions, but like C Sharp is for like whole applications that can, you know, have different parts, like maybe a database front end, a database back end, some shared code maybe a GUI, maybe some kind of support library, maybe a dedicated library for an API. And so um, this SL solution file is just a way to basically describe what all those different projects are and how they interrelate. For the purposes of this lab, you don't really need to know much about this. The main reason we built this is because it makes it so when you run .NET build or .NET, et cetera, in the root of the directory, it'll just do everything that's in the folder. Um, but this is very important if you are um, working with larger projects to have this. It's just a way to tell, it used to have no bearing in Visual Studio Code. Um, the new dev kit thing, which I mentioned earlier, now has what's called a solution explorer, which basically will translate this file for you and give you a nice little like menu tree and you can add projects to it and do all that stuff like you would typically do in Visual Studio. For the most part though, I mean, unless you're a total guru, you're never hand editing this file. You're either using the .NET SLN commands to add and remove stuff to it, or you're using the graphical stuff and hand editing this file as a last resort, because it's a terrible format. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense for what it was at the time, but it's a very old format, very, very old. Um, and so as a result, it, it carries some cruft with it. So. Yep. Um, so that's basically what that is. But in the solution files, you can see there's sections there for different projects and paths to them. So in those paths, as we come through here, we have a few different examples. And each of those points to this thing called a csproj file. And that stands for C sharp project, csproj. Uh, and this is for different projects, like an F sharp project is going to be an FS proj, F sharp project. And so um, before I get too much into what these files are, I'll just break real quick for questions. Any questions so far? Everybody able to see this in the code spaces? I'm not seeing any double hands, which is way better than I expected. That is fantastic. <laughs> we're good. Was, awesome. Yeah, we were half expecting half the room to be in. It's like, all right, so we're going to spend a half hour while we go fix everything. And so that's great. I'm really glad you guys can all see this. Okay. Power of GitHub code spaces. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Um, so let me shrink this down just a little bit. In fact, let yeah. me hide the Explorer so we can just look minus. at this file. Do you want... Oh yeah, Swedish keyboard. Give Swedish me a keyboard. Is that good? That should be hopefully. It, good do you still read it? We, we can move some stuff around if we need to. Yeah. Don't worry about all the. You can guys. Thumbs read. from the back. It's yeah. Good. So don't worry about the comments. You guys can read those on your own. I'm just going to kind of focus on the main aspects. We so have look at here. the blue stuff. Yeah, focus on the blue stuff. Um, so uh, this is an XML file. Um, it's defined in XML. And that's just, again, that's, that was what was de rigueur at the time that this was done. I mean, there's no reason it could be a JSON file or a YAML file, but th that's what it is. And that's what .NET expects. It's just a way of describing something just like you would at anything else, but it describes what your project looks like. Um, so you start with uh, your project and this, you don't have to put this SDK part there. Um, there's a little trick you can do, which I don't think I built into the code space, but there, I did actually figure out a way to get IntelliSense for this whole file where if you go do things in Visual Studio Code, it, it can fix your, it can tell you what your options are and fix it and that kind of stuff. But that's one of the requirements. It's kind of Byzantine. Don't worry about that part. Um, just be clear about some of these parts. And 
If you ever wanted to find your own, you just do something called .NET New Class Lib, which again uses that same templating engine that I use for Mortar, and will scaffold like a basic version of this for you. There is also one that is built specifically for PowerShell modules, where you have to run a couple commands and do .NET New -I to install it from the repo. It's put out by the PowerShell team, and you do .NET New PS module, and it'll give you sort of a starter template for uh, what's called a standard module, which work across PowerShell 5 and 7. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but the key thing to know about that is there's a couple little issues with that, and so we just have some examples here um, in its place. So one of the first things you can do, this is totally optional, this assembly name, but this is where you can define when your thing comes out as a DLL file, what it's gonna be named. So rather than having coming out as example.1.powershell.dll, it'll come out as peupowershell.dll. And so this is just an easy way to make it that if you want your module to be named something different than the folder that it's in, then you define this. If you, if you want it to be the same, you don't need this, but because our examples are different from what we're gonna output, then you need this line. Um, this is a pretty key line. So this target framework. So .NET frameworks are sort of like, like API revisions. They're like levels of availability. And one of the great things about the new PowerShell is because the new PowerShell has pegged itself to those .NET releases, that every time a new .NET release comes out, a new version of PowerShell comes out and they're sort of tied, then these .NET releases correlate really well to certain PowerShell versions. So what they basically do is they sort of define like an API floor. They basically define like, hey, there's all this functionality that may have been added, but if you don't need that and you want to stay compatible, you t define a target, and then as you write the code, it'll prevent you from doing like the, the new fancy stuff that's not going to work in newer versions of the code. So here's a few examples. And these go, there's a ton of these, that, of these targets. For the purposes of a PowerShell module, you really only need to understand three in this day and age. Uh, the first one is... If you're building a modern PowerShell module, uh, Net7, that's PowerShell 7.3. If you went to Emmanuel's talk, he talked about how his uh, um, the bicep module now requires PowerShell 7.3. And can you talk about why that was? Because the dependencies we were using were building on .NET 7 now, which means that if we want to load them, we also need to be running .NET 7, which means we need to be running PowerShell 7.3 and up. Yeah. So, and PowerShell 7.3 runs on .NET 7. So, it, it basically, he had to, his dependencies required him to go up to that level. So, that's why it couldn't be compatible lower, at least not without a lot of very painful work. There's a great um, support kind of table on the PowerShell. If you Google like PowerShell support lifecycle, uh, the first article, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, at the bottom, there's a table which matches PowerShell versions and which .NET version it's uh, built on. So, there you can see kind of what you want to target in case you want something newer. Yeah. So like vast majority of my modules these days, all the ones we're going to build today are going to target .NET 6 or NET 6.0 as it's shown here. And that's that is, the LTS. Yeah, that's the current LTS version. So if you're if you're on the camera and you're watching this presentation five years from now, you're probably not doing this. This is probably out of support by then. <laughs> but for the purposes of as of today in 2023, these are the current like best levels to target. And so if you do, the 7.2 is the long-term support version. It's three years, I believe, of like mainstream support. So if you target this, it's still going to work on 7.3 as well. Um, but, you know, you're, you're, basically your modules will work on 7.2 up as long as there's no breaking changes in those future modules. And .NET's pretty good about not making breaking changes unless there's a really, really good reason. So then the uh, final one, sorry, how dare you? Ah, you wanted to talk about that. Yeah, the final sorry. one is um, the NET standard 2.0. And that's what you're going to do if you want to build modules for PowerShell 5.1. 5.1 is, you know, very old at this point, but it is also built into everything, and so we all got to be aware of it. So if you have a module that has to run on a 5.1 server, you know, if you have a module that runs locally and then remotes and does other things, I recommend you do that because then your module doesn't have to be 5.1. But if you have to write it in 5.1, then you can target this thing called Net Standard 2.0, which is a very complicated layer that bridges the difference between the .NET framework and .NET standard. And there's another thing called multi-targeting we'll talk about really briefly. But basically, this is the option. I will be clear, though. If you're doing anything more than something fairly simple, this is going to be painful. Like, you're going to run into all kinds of problems and conflicts. Your dependencies probably aren't going to work. Um, so if you really, you really want to make sure, ask yourself, do you really need this to run on 5.1? If you don't, your life will be infinitely better if you start at that net 6.0 or above. So for our examples, we're doing a net 6.0. And so... Um, for our examples, we're doing a net 6.0. And then... Uh, those are kind of like the, the main things. A lot of this other stuff is just going to be some scaffolding, especially the dependencies. But in this property group, 
This is just a real simple thing. Um, it's, this is something that's kind of obscure. You won't find a lot of articles on it, but I found if you put this in, when you do your publish, it takes a bunch of extra localization files out, so your publish is much cleaner. There's reasons you want to do this if you're making a, a international file that has like lots of different languages in the error message, but if you're just doing a simple module, this just makes things cleaner, so it's easier for you guys to understand. What are these packages? These packages. Are those the NuGet packages we've been they look talking nice. about? Yeah, I like these. So um, one of the things we remember we talked about, like, why do you want to do this? Like, why are we wasting all this time in this room? Um, one of the reasons you want to do this is that, again, somebody may have written something you already know before. So there's this module out there that we chose for this demo called Lorem Universal Net. And it's Lorem stands for Lorem Ipsum, which if you're not familiar, is a very standard way of just generating random text. So this is a module that generates a lot of random things, generates random words, random sentences, random dates. And so you could write all that yourself in C Sharp, um, you know, you don't have, but it's going to be a lot. You're going to be a lot. You're going to get into it, um, or you can just utilize a package that somebody already wrote. That's a simple version. But I have another example here for subnet math, where like you can write a whole complicated thing and have the bugs and have everything, or you can use something that's been bullet tested, proven, millions of downloads, and just utilize. They've already done all the hard work for you, and you can just use that in your module. So these are what are called NuGet packages. I'll let Emmanuel talk a bit about those. Yeah, so they have versions like all other packages, and you can include them by packages, package references in your C Sharp project file, which lets you import them to your project and use them in your C Sharp code, which in turn, if we expose them as commandlets, we can utilize the functionality from those packages in PowerShell. Yeah. You can think of these sort of like PowerShell modules. In fact, PowerShell modules are NuGet packages. They just hide all that implementation from you. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Like, yeah. if you ever if you ever go to the PowerShell gallery and raw download like a PowerShell module zip, if you open it up, it's a NuGet package. Like, it'll have all the same structure. I mean, it's basically a zip file with some metadata. Basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah NuGet package in turn is just a zip file. So we also have this fun string called private assets all, which basically means that when we export this, we don't want the DLLs for it together with the publishing. Yeah. So. If we're running system management automation, for example, we already have this loaded in PowerShell, so we don't need it in our module as well because yeah. PowerShell is already using I, that. And to clarify, that system management automation sounds really general, but that's literally like the PowerShell SDK, basically. So, like all our, like, remember where we inherited from that commandlet command or that PS commandlet? That comes from this package. It, it defines what that all looks like. But we don't want to ship an 80 meg PowerShell DLL with every one of our modules because it already exists where we're targeting, not to mention the conflicts that can arise. So that private asset is just a simple way to say, hey, don't ship this with my module. I don't need it because it's already there where I'm going. So we have a few minutes left for the break. So why don't we try running our first command here? I'm going to open up the terminal and hopefully is it zoomed enough. If I, if I write .NET, can you see that? We good? Looks good. All right. So if I run .NET build right in the root of the repo, we are going to find the solution file and we're going to build all of our uh, projects. But um, we can also specify the framework saying .NET 6.0 and we need that for one of our further examples. So if we try just building it, doing like, like this, it's going to find all the projects and make a lot of errors because something uh, smooth. Let's see. I think that's still just. I can also just sorry. Don't need to claim. Try that. Otherwise, I'll just build the specific specific project instead. We'll try that instead. Yeah, just go the specific. So, canceling that. Oh, sorry. I think you might be in a really old code space. Ah, yeah. Unless those are just the presentation, those might just be the okay. slide. For now, we'll fix yeah. that during the break. Yeah. So what we can do, we can also target a specific project. So I can build the uh, source code if we go to source, and then example one, uh, example one. And then if I just specify the folder, it's going to find the first uh, project in there, but I can also uh, specify the CS project file. Doesn't look so, so good with that, so I'm going to just do it like this. Yeah. Um, and that's going to build our project. And building the project means compiling it. So we now have binaries that are output in a bin for binary uh, catalog. And we have two configuration options here. We can build a debug version or we can build a release version. The default up to .NET 7 is debug 
from .NET 8 and onwards is going to be defaulting to release. And what are these? Well, debug comes with a lot of built-in extra information that takes space that lets you debug it easily, like symbols and stuff. And if you want to release it out in the web, you probably want a smaller file size. Yeah. Also, I just realized why that didn't work. Yeah. So in our Today I Learned thing, so we went, we updated our project files, and we updated, we realized, like, oh, we accidentally set some of these .NET 7, we wanted to drop them .NET 6. But I'm pretty sure we didn't update our solution file to That's also true. note that. So the solution file is looking for that, not finding it. Yeah, so if you yeah. build a solution file, it's going to try to find the wrong one. So uh, try building example per example, and we'll yeah. see if we figure and it out And again, later. you can specify the path that way. You can also just go into the folder itself and just type .NET build, and it'll find that same csproj. So whichever style you like. Um, you know, you can do it both ways. Yeah. Uh, so what is this? This DLL file is actually our module. So before taking a quick break, we can actually just write import module and go to that source file. So it's going to be like a few catalogs down here. So I can right click and take copy path or copy relative path maybe. And we can just do this dot slash source I think we probably want. How about you uh, do a verbose on that? Let's see what actually yeah. happened. That's a good idea. And we got... So nothing came out, but that's probably a good out. thing because that example is... Yeah. That example actually does not hold any C-sharp binaries. Yeah, I don't see a CS file in there. So. Yeah. So the first one is actually a way for utilizing C-sharp project files together with PowerShell. And this... Whoops. We can close this one. This is actually a PowerShell module, using script module, that imports, in the start of it, the DLL up here, the publish DLLs, which in turn imports all our uh, dependencies. But not when we use build. Um, so we would have actually needed to use publish here. So .NET publish, if we clear this real quick. .NET publish is another keyword which actually takes all the dependencies and puts them in the output folder. And the difference there is that building it is kind of like compiling it only and publishing is making sure that we get everything with it that we need to um, to uh, work or yeah. actually make it available kind for of like publish and release it online somewhere. So generally uh, we're going to publish it and if we do that with the source example 1 um, we can specify the folder, it's going to find the project. We're going to see that we have a new folder here in the debug.net6 called publish. And that one actually has our dependencies, like the lorem net that we mentioned. So if we instead just before break import import module, but we don't import that one, we import the source, example one, uh, bin debug.net6 publish, and then the pu.dll. Remember, that's example one, so you actually want the module, the oh, PSM. Oh, yeah, that's true. We want the lorem, sorry. Lorem, like that. Yeah, well, the, uh, remember, this is example one, so we want to import the PowerShell module oh, you're which right. references yeah, those you're right. Sorry. Oops. Too many That saliva ice kicking in right about now. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, the first one there, and in there we have our example one dot psm one. So that one imports all our functions in this case, and we can see that we have one function called write uh, pu random color message, which we can just try real quick here. I'm going to just close some stuff down. Oh, you made Andy Jordan mad. It's okay. There we go. And we're going to say message. Oops. Hello world. And it comes out in a random color. So we used the module to generate a random hex. And then we, or not module actually, in this case it's just our lorem dependency, the assembly. So this is the one way you can do it in PowerShell. And I think we're going to take like a 15 minute break. So we'll be back at five past and talk about how we can do this in C sharp instead. All right, so Any questions yeah. so so far before we get going? Awesome. Once going twice. All right, we'll see you in about 15 minutes and we'll uh, go to the next section.
right. I, I think we might as well get going again. Uh, most people are back. Otherwise, uh, we'll hope they ask questions if they're stuck on something. So I did something very quickly before we took a small break, uh, and that was .NET build and .NET publish. Um, by the end, I talked a lot about build, and then I ended up doing publish anyway. So that's not very fair. And the difference there, if we go to the left side here and look in the, the catalogs, uh, or the containers and the folders and the directories, when we run .NET publish, I'm going to run, run it in the root folder, uh, which now works because Jakob was so clean to tell us that we can run git clean dash fd capital X, which will remove all the non-tracked files from our repo, which means that my corrupted old object folders here um, that weren't letting me publish, they now were deleted and we can re redo it. But basically if I run .NET not too many. Okay. Dot .NET publish in the root. It's going to publish all the source. Yeah, thanks. Um, source. Uh, sorry, on the solution in the source um, folder. Um, and you'll know there's the one folder. there that erred for multi target. Yeah. So one of our repos has a multi target where we need to specify actually the framework. So we say net 6.0. Um, and we can see here, what I wanted to show you why it's a lot of things, is that we have a publish folder uh, up there on our right side. And this one is the one needed for, for our dependencies. So this is where our module imports all the DLLs at the example one, at least. Yeah, so, so if we... I would say get that path in your brain. I know it's a big, ugly, deep path, bin, debug, whatever your framework is. But basically that, and then publish, and that path is where your output is. Now, there is a way to change that. You can just use dash O when you do a .NET output, and you can change it to wherever you want. You can put that in your build scripts if you just want it to be out in a local folder. But that's the .NET default. So as we always like to say, like, don't change the defaults unless you have a good reason. Um, so, but that, that's where that there, you know, it's, it's a lot of extra organization. It's very, very neat and tidy, but just be aware it's, it's all that nested stuff. Thankfully, uh, Visual Studio makes it really easy for you that if, if folders are nested and there's nothing else in them, that's why you get that bin debug net 6.0 as opposed to bin debug net 6 that you have to drill into. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, like a quick overview of the code here so that sure. we can compare it with the next example? Sure. So this is an example that, um, as we mentioned, um, you can you one thing we didn't really also mention as an utilization is like you can utilize like libraries that are C sharp libraries, but not actually have to write C sharp code um, because a PowerShell is a full .NET language and it can interact with .NET stuff. You've probably done this before um, if you've ever like utilized any of the native stuff or you've done like date time colon colon now. That's that's making a .NET call or you're, you've called like some method on something. Um, so you can still do that, but you can do it with any any library. The tricky thing is handling all the dependencies and like making sure that everything that that thing has and the DLLs and trying to do all that manually and manually downloading those files, that can be very difficult. So um, what's really nice is you can utilize .NET to go out and gather all those uh, DLLs for you. Uh, they're called assemblies, and what they basically are is it's the compiled code put into a file, and that file usually ends in .dll. It's, it's a little different than like really old DLLs you might be aware of, but just know that that's, that's just where your compiled C sharp code is. When you see a DLL, you know, don't get scared of it. That's just, it's just, it's where your code is. And so um, this is an example of where we're utilizing a library, but our entire module is actually written in PowerShell. So we have a function to get random color, as uh, he showed for the color message. And in, in, in good function design, you know, we, we separated concerns, and so we didn't put all this language here. We have a separate command for that so that we can change that later and not worry about changing how this command works. And then we have some PS style stuff that we did, and then we went ahead and wrote the output. You know, real standard PowerShell stuff, real simple, but the only main difference is that we're utilizing this third-party library. We're calling its namespace, uh, we're going to the individual function, and then this double colon um, calls what's called a static method, which you don't need to know too much about any of this stuff if you've never seen it before. All it just simply means is that we're calling .NET code from PowerShell, from, from a C-sharp library. And we're basically asking, give us a random number, a random hex number. And then we use that hex number to generate a what's called an ANSI color code, which just basically is a way to use numbers to represent a color, and then writing the output using that random color. 
Um, there's another function here that's just an, a simple example that's sort of more, yeah, question? Just to ask, uh, are you going to cover any tips on if we're trying to leverage .NET and PowerShell, how to investigate and find your needs? Sadly, yeah, we're not going to go too much into the, because of the time constraints, we're not going to go too much into reflection. The good news is there is a boatload of information on that out there, and uh, maybe it'll be a good future talk if there's enough demand, so. Um, yeah, we're not going to talk too much about that, but it's, it's the usual tools you've used before. Get random, or not? <laughs> yeah, that, that <laughs> works random. really well. Hope for the best. Get get method. Get random. Like that, that's copilot in a nutshell, right? <laughs> um, uh, so get you know, like get member. You know those kind of tools that you typically use to investigate. Those are all using what in .NET what's called reflection, which is looking at the structure of the code itself, and you can use those same to to, to do that work. Um, Another function here, this is a little kind of broad, but this is a simple example that I could have written. This just simply takes like, if you have, if you guys are familiar with networking, I know not everybody is, but like if you have an IP address like 192.168.11 and you want to know if that's in the 192.158.00 slash 12, you know, well, you can do the subnet math yourself. You could write some PowerShell code to maybe do all the binaries and all that kind of stuff. Or you can use a proven tested library used by millions of people, completely unit tested that just does it. And as you can see, the only thing I had to do was take those networks as objects to my parameters to my thing, which this uh, transparently converts to a string. So if you put in the string, it knows and takes that and converts it. Sorry, I said that backwards. It, if you give it just a string, that's 192.168.25, it'll convert that into the .NET object equivalent that it can work with. And then I just run this method on it that does the comparison. And then we, of course, export our functions. So that's what the PowerShell codes looks like. Um, this same code can be done. That, that, that's an example of one that like works PowerShell 2 and up because we did the net 6.0. Um, here is another version of that. Most of this is pretty much the same. This is a little more complicated. Um, I meant to take the nullable stuff out here. Don't worry about If you see nullable and the self-contained and the language version, don't worry too much about those. It's a little too much for this talk. Um, nullable is really great. Those are called nullable reference types. It lets you really eat much more easily avoid null reference codes and no pointers and all those errors that you constantly get in PowerShell. Um, but don't worry about that for right now. Um, the, other than that, this is basically the same file as the other one. The main difference is the target framework is now net standard 2.0. So by doing that... Does this work, work in PowerShell 5 and 1? Yeah, so below? rather than the system management automation, which we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. which is like the PowerShell SDK, we reference this new special thing called PowerShell standard.library. So this is something that the PowerShell team made that is almost like a mock. It sort of fakes like what would be in both PowerShell 5.1 and everything in PowerShell 6 and up so that when you go to write the code, you know, you don't get errors and you don't have to deal with going completely from .NET framework to .NET core. This just makes it so that you can just write your code. You have to write it to that sort of .NET, what's called .NET 4.7.2 level. So you can't use any of the fancy features that have come out in the next last, like, what, five, six years? Yeah, yeah you still got to write to that code level, but when you write this and you publish it, then this module, um, which I believe you, you did a publish, right? We got yep. it. Net, yeah, there's our net standard. There's our publish. And our module should have at the top to go to the net standard. So, let's see, do you have a tab for PowerShell 5.1 here? I could probably do it in your other one. But. Yeah, there it is. You can zoom in. Uh, let's see, do you have a, do you have a 5.1 in here? Oh my god, your Swedish keyboard is going to kill me. <laughs> what do you want? Uh, control tilde. Where's the tilde again? Uh, there. As long as I got F1, I'll be okay. You know what? That's not working. You know what? Control Shift P. There's my happy place, right? <laughs> sure. I don't want the extension terminal. You want to open the terminal? Yeah. Help me. Ah, it's a classic uh, Control R. Control <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, huh? Yeah. God, how did I not know that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there you go. All right, so we uh, have this, and we'll pull up. Something to note, uh, fun fact. You lied to me. You do not have PowerShell in here. Uh, go, right. go to we're gonna, we're gonna terminal. Cheat. No, we're going to cheat. We're just going to do okay. PowerShell. Yeah. Yeah. See here. All right. Oh, That's my God, good. your keyboard. Yeah, you're in a container. So Damn it. It's the Linux one, isn't it? Yeah. Code spaces is terrible, everybody. Don't use it. Not great for examples. <laughs> so... So uh, what would have happened had I been able to open PowerShell was that you would have seen us be able to run the same command in both PowerShell.exe and PWSH.exe. So wh when you complete all the labs and you publish this module yourself, and I find this on the PowerShell gallery, um, if I'm on Windows PowerShell and I install your module, it will work just fine. And, but, and you don't have to think about 
what's on Windows PowerShell. You don't have to make separate modules for both to let you code across both. I saw that there's a higher version of Net Standard 2.1. Yeah. Uh, Why so, aren't we upgrading? Well, you know, we talked about that there's all kinds of things. There's like Net 471, Net 470, Net Standard 2.0, Net Standard 1.0, Net Standard 2.1. Why don't we want to be on the latest version of Net Standard? It's a standard, right? Well, as of when PowerShell 5.1 came out, because we were talking about this tracking, that, that's about when Net Standard 2.0 came out. Net Standard 2.1 is ahead of where PowerShell 5.1 is. So if you build to Net Standard 5.1, it might work. Like, again, if the code all lines up and there's no changes, it Net might standard work. Net Standard 2.1. Did I say 2.1? Oh, cool. You said 5.1. Oh, 5.1, excuse me. So if you build, if you target net standard 2.1 because you see it, you know, it's like, oh, net standard 2.1 must be newer. It's ahead of where 5.1 is. So it might work, but it will probably break. And it will break with very weird assembly errors that are impossible to fix. So if you ever wonder, like, why if we're building for 5.1, that's why. Because net standard 2.0 is the last version that tracks with the Windows PowerShell version that, like, ships in most Windows computers. So, but otherwise, the um, code here is the same code. Small difference here that we talked about, again, that you probably know if you write for PowerShell 5.1, we can't use our fancy escape characters. We had to drop down to the way that PowerShell 5.1 does it with, uh, you know, building a special character and throwing that escape character in. So this is a consideration, but this is not like typically a C-sharp consideration, but this is just to show you, you still have to do those same considerations. Like if you're writing stuff for PowerShell 5.1, you have to use 5.1 syntax. So... No for each parallel, none of that fancy stuff. Okay, so that's pretty much an idea of using .NET with um, um, just as using .NET with PowerShell, being able to use libraries. If you look at a lot of my examples, a lot of my examples, some of my um, like Mortar, for instance, uh, I write almost no C# -sharp code actually in there. It, it just it's I just import the templating libraries, but everything else is written in PowerShell. But there are times when it makes sense to actually write that stuff in PowerShell itself. So Emmanuel is going to talk about an example there. In C Sharp. In C Sharp, yeah. yeah. Did I say C Sharp? You said PowerShell. <laughs> so, when, well, yeah. that's the problem. I know not to trust Yakov again. Yeah. So in C Sharp, we have something called CS files. These are C Sharp files, and this is where our source code resides. I'm going to take this down. This fine. Um, so this is a C sharp file, and it contains that nice com comparison that we saw earlier with a commandlet. So this mostly looks what like what we saw before, right? So we have commandlet here on line five, uh, which mirrors kind of the commandlet binding thing with. Uh, well, not really. Uh, bad comparison. But this is what we need to mark with an attribute for our class to say that this is a uh, commandlet with this name. So it actually takes a verb here, comma, noun. Uh, in C Sharp, we have a collection, or rather in system management automation, we have collections of the approved verbs. So we can just say verbs, common, dot get, and we will get a well, what, string of get. So where are some of the other verbs? Uh, there's a lot of them, actually. Yeah, so if I go dot here, we see there's a lot of them here. But we also have oh, that's not nice. just verbs something. We have all the other spaces that... Okay, so like I don't just have to guess no. what the verb is. I got IntelliSense for it. Exactly. That's nice. That's something I don't get in PowerShell. I just got to guess at it in the string when I name the function. That's true. I like it. Unless you I get, get verb, of course. Get but, verb, yeah. But, which has better yeah. uh, descriptions, at least. You can, but PowerShell won't like it when you import the mod. Repeat the question. Okay, so when uh, when we write this, can I put my own verb? Can I just say like fix? For example, I don't think that's a verb. Uh, uh, yes, we can, but we won't be able to. Uh, well, PowerShell won't like it when we import the module. I think it allows it, but it says like warning: we don't like this verb. Thanks. Yeah. I don't know. You can put both the string and the enum there. That's cool. Yeah. So? so this is just a this is just a string. So you can uh, put oh, pretty right. much oh. anything, um, but you get a, a nice reference to it. Uh, in this case, we say get something date. There's a question over here. Yeah, so from that library, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the so question it's was... it's predefined in PowerShell. Like, they've, they've, if you, when you do git verb, it's pulling from this same yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, the question was whether or not uh, I'm this, sorry. this list comes from system management automation. And yes, Strike it does. for me. Uh, it comes from that package, which we get, which we also get the PS commandlet type from, which we need to inherit from to create can a I see, commandlet. Can you show me what that PS commandlet looks like? Because I don't know what any of these functions are. Uh, can we go to its definition and get an idea? Uh, we probably could. I could right click here and go to definition, and we can see how this actually looks in what's called a namespace system management yeah, that, automation. Yeah, that top line there, that looks like a NuGet package. Oh, that's where it is. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So this is actually where NuGet um, from VS Code has like restored, as it's called, this um, DLL locally. And it's uh, kind of looking at what this object looks like. And most of the time we can get some information on how it looks, but we can also rarely, depending on what information we have available, see how it's built. And that's part of more um, yeah. uh, release information and debug stuff. Uh, but here we can we can see that we have a class named get pu like PowerShell u or psconf u random date commandlet. Um, this can be named anything because the name of the actual commandlet that we get in PowerShell is determined by this attribute up here. We need to inherit from commandlet or ps commandlet. Ps commandlet gives us more information as Justin talked about. It gives us all the like invocation information and stuff like that, and makes it more of an advanced function. Uh, to draw a parallel. And then we have two parameters, which also are marked with the parameter attribute. These are marked on top of what's called properties. Um, we write them as public, and then the type, and then we say the name of them. We have get set to indicate that they are both gettable and settable. If you write um, get member and run that on like a, a type, you might see using force, I believe, you get all the setters and getters and stuff in PowerShell if you want to deep dive into re reflection. And then we set a default value here, equals um, 1950 January. And the default of not after is 2150. And then here, since it's a random date, we're going to default between these 200 years. And if someone specifies something else, we use that instead. And use the lorem date time function here, which oh, wait, we can use. Can you go back and hover over that date time again? This one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it can tell me, show me like what I actually need to call that function. That's cool. Yeah, since we import the package up here, lorem net, which we have added in our CS project file, we will be able to get IntelliSense for all those types available as well. So I could actually, if I want, just click dot here and see what kind of stuff is available for me. What methods do I have on lorem as static methods, as we mentioned. I don't need to create a lorem object here. I don't have a reference and a variable. So I can just run them on the type, like string colon colon is not null or empty, for example. It's kind of the same thing. That would look like this here. It's not null or empty. Um, so if I write lorem, I can use other ones as well. But in this case, we have date time. And that one actually has a few ways we can run it called overloads. These are ways uh, or versions or variants of how we can run methods in .NET. So we can have the same method with different you could call them parameter sets, maybe. Yeah, I like. Yeah, they're kind of like parameter sets. Like if you write a function, you can have like a certain parameter set that's like you know, like the in, the person's name and their birthday and that kind of thing. But maybe you have another parameter set that's just an an object that contains other information, but it's you're ending at the same result. It's kind of like that. It's just like different ways to arrive at the same result with different yeah. parameters. And in this case, we can specify the minimum, the minimum and maximum, or um, just run it without uh, anything and let it use some default values here or specify them as we wish. But if we just go back to what it was before, we can compile this and see how it works. And this is just one of the files, I should say, in our folder. So we actually have a few of them. So how does the CS project know that we have several commandlets? Does it just look in the same folder and build everything? Uh, yeah, I mean, let's see. So as far as the CS project goes, uh, we have these .cs files. So one nice thing about C Sharp is you can put these files anywhere you want. You can put them nested. You can have them all in the same folder. You can, as long as they're like at where the CS project file is or below, you can organize it however you want. So it's 
Um, some languages are much more specific about where you have to put your files, but C-sharp's very fluid about that. You can even do things, which we're not going to get into this, but like you can split a class. You can have like one part of the implementation in one file and another part of it in another file. And the reason you might want to do that is that um, maybe different teams maintain different parts of that, or maybe you have a very specific kind of logic that needs to be in a different file. There's lots of, there's all kinds of, um, just like in Windows, you know, there's like five different ways to close a window. There's like five different ways to do any any individual thing in C Sharp. Yeah, Not there's that. a lot of uh, syntax differences yeah. and, and things that you can use in C Sharp that you don't have access to in PowerShell, and particularly are, around classes and the way they're built. Yeah, not too many are inherently good or bad, but there's plenty of religious wars that get started over them. So <laughs> prepare for that. Yeah. Uh, something to note at the top, we've been seeing this using. This tells us that we want to import the functionality from this namespace. What is a namespace? Uh, well, let's see. A namespace is an idea that you can... If Remember when we had that lorem net dot? Imagine that you wrote two functions and you imported a library and that library says write message. Well, your project says write message. So how do you know which one to call? That's where namespaces come in. They just make it so that you can separate. They're sort of like different mod, you know, sort of like different module commands where you can say this one's here and that one's there. Um, that namespace is kind of weird though. Like I've seen, like I remember watching like old C sharp examples and you just like namespace with like a brackets. Yeah, this what? is called a file scoped namespace, and it came in I think C sharp nine or something. Oh, okay. Where you can just put it on top somewhere before your actual functionality. I can have it here as well. Um, usually there was something like like this, as you mentioned, which scoped everything okay. in that namespace. So, so if I see an example like that, that I could just do the same thing here. Because I like that yeah. a lot more. That is like... It's very clean. Yeah, it and drives it me takes... crazy. Like, there, there's, a, there's an online video by Code Aesthetic called I'm a Never Nester. I love it. It's, go look that up if you haven't seen it. It's a great video. But um, I really like to like try to keep my code as much to the left as possible because I don't want to scroll that bar left and back and forth. So this is like one more great way to make it so that all my code shifts left. I don't have to have everything in that weird namespace bracket. That's yeah. cool. Let's try to build this again then, I think. Because uh, this one takes the entire file and puts that in a namespace. That's the file scope namespace. So if we go to product three, uh, we also saw, I should say, the const thing, which I did not mention. So let's go into that real quick. We have another file here, which it's using just a static class. This is not the commandlet. And it holds some references to strings that we like. Um, in this case, we have a module prefix so that we don't have to, to write PEU random for every single commandlet. We can just refer to this one instead. In case we want to rename our module at some point before releasing it, we can do that in one simple location. And then here, we actually have a module manifest. So this one, is kind of how we most likely will use C sharp modules, binary modules, yeah. by pointing at them in the root module of our manifest and then importing the manifest. Because all good modules are written with a manifest. Of course. You guys, all your modules are with manifest, right? If you, if you want to publish to the gallery, you have to have a manifest. But again, if you've written a PowerShell module, this manifest is pretty much exactly the same. There's like two main differences. The root module is going to point to a DLL or it's going to point to a PowerShell file that's going to load your DLLs if you have a complicated setup. And then rather than saying functions to export, you're going to do commandlets to export to very specifically say you're doing those C-sharp versions of those commands. Other so, than that, so it's that's basically one the of the, file. the main differences down here. We also say required assemblies here to make sure that we load this one. Um, and there are some, some interesting differences in, in all these different ways of loading assemblies that I will talk about tomorrow. Uh, at the bottom, as Justin mentions, we make sure to export them as commandlets because that's what they are. If we would put them in the functions, we would not be exporting anything from our manifest for our module because we don't have any functions. Functions are written in PowerShell and these are commandlets which are written in this case in C-sharp. Um, so if we want to build this, we can do the exact same actually. We can just run .NET Publish either on the source or on the specific project. In this case, we already have, so we actually have the folder because we, we published the solution file in the root catalog, which points at all the different projects. So all of these examples are now, after running this uh, code, they are published and they have the correct one here. So if we want, we can actually import this module down uh, here, this one, the manifest. So I can copy relative path. And then I might just see if that works. Yeah, and same. If you're following along, you can just run this same thing here. 
Yeah. But you'll need to import uh, module for And I might that does help. want like a Im import what, what's, module. What's the Swedish key for import module? Ooh. Uh, am I in the right directory? The dot plot, you need a dot, dot source yeah, that's true. See, PowerShell saving you once again. There you go. What, where's my verbose? I don't see no commandlets. Yeah, that's true. Verbose. There you go. There we go. That's what I like to see. And oh, we yeah, have tests that things are actually working. Yeah. So we can see if we just do this real quick. We can see from, from here that we're loading this module from uh, the PSD1 file, so the manifest, which in turn will be loading an assembly from this one. We see that the first thing processed is the required assemblies. So we load the lorem net, and then we load the binary module, which uses the lorem net one. And that was because of that required assembly thing. Yeah, put in, right. right? Okay. So it actually shows up, and verbose on import module is almost a must, I would say. It's so nice when, when building modules to see what's being exported, what we're missing, what we're doing wrong, and if we get an error, we might see like where we stopped. Oh, very important point, too, is that as you're making changes to modules, it's much more painful than it is in PowerShell. In PowerShell, you can just change a model, import it with force, and that's good. Usually, if you're doing it in C-sharp, when you import that assembly, um, Manuel will talk about it this a bit about tomorrow, but basically once that assembly is in there, you can't get it out. So if you want to make a change, you pretty much have to kill your PowerShell session, open a new one, and then re-import. Um, yeah. Some of our tasks and some of the troubleshooting and debugging that I've put in, there's ways to make that process much easier and more automated, of course, because PowerShell we're all about automation. We're not going to go too much into those today, but just be aware of that as a thing. If you're making changes and you're not seeing the changes, try killing your PowerShell session and starting completely over and then importing again. That's one of the most common things that it's not immediately obvious until you've been yeah. doing it for like a half hour and you're like, oh, dang it, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> your, your dependency down here is already loaded in an older yeah. version and you don't realize because the manifest says, oh yeah, good. Um, yeah. So that's uh, something to be very aware of. Uh, I'll kill this for a moment. And then we think we'll take a look at example four, which is a hybrid module example. So this one was written in just C sharp. You have a question? No, so, so the question was, uh, can we import a DLL file directly or do we need like a manifest? We can absolutely import and I can show that uh, actually. So let's do that. Uh, I'll just start a new session here, um, a little bit on the side and so, we'll see, yeah. So yeah, while you get that ready, there's a couple different things we're importing here too. So everything's an assembly and the only difference between like an assembly that has a command lid in it is that it has that little attribute. Remember in the code, there was that little, uh, that little uh, attribute that said like the git whatever. That's what PowerShell actually reads the assembly. And when it sees that, it says, oh, this is a commandlet and I need to load this in as a commandlet. Other than that, all assemblies are the same. So when we do the import, um, when we did the import module, we were able to do it directly against the DLL as he showed there. And you can do that when you load a module, when it sees those attributes in the compiled code, that's how it gets them. If you do this with just like a regular DLL, it'll still work, but you won't see anything. Typically with regular DLLs, you want to do something called add type. It's just faster than that. So you can, a common thing that can be done if you're not building a module or using this, is you can just use add type to bring in assemblies. So what's going to happen when we run this? Because we imported the root module, we won't... How did that work? Yeah. Why did this work? You want me to tell you why it worked? Yeah. Well, one, I don't know if you restarted the session, but even if you didn't, um, one thing if you're writing a .NET Core module is that if it's a commandlet and there's dependencies, it has an automatic resolver where it'll look in the same directory if that dependency is there. So it found your dependency in the same directory. Yeah, so if we try the same thing, just quick side note here, we try the same thing, but we don't get it from the publish folder. We just get it from here where we built it earlier. Is it going to work now? I'm in. No, because the lorem net is not in the same directory. So, so when we load the root module from the DLL, it's not going to find that one and load it. So when we try to use our commandlet, we don't get any errors when importing the module because we haven't tried any functionality from the lorem one. It's not going to work because we don't find the DLL. And that is a lot of the crux with working with binary modules and the assemblies, making sure that PowerShell finds them or sometimes that not, does not find them. Yeah. So crystal clear reason why you like use publish in addition to build is publish brings all that stuff together for you. Yeah. So let's uh, have a look at hybrid modules. Justin, do you want to 
explain how this works? Sure. So um, we talked about things about how we have different um, types of modules that we can have. I'm going to just double check this guy real quick. Uh, so with a hybrid module, um, you can write things in PowerShell, we've shown. You can write them in pure C Sharp, but you can also sometimes do a little bit of both. Like Pester is a great example. Pester has certain parts that are written in C Sharp and are never meant for like a PowerShell user's consumption. It's done for all the back-end things, the modeling, the way to um, set up the test that's both fast and much more accurate so that there's less bugs. But then the actual interface can be written in PowerShell and a lot of that user part done as well as like a, the other stuff that just makes more sense to be written in PowerShell. Those two things can interact together. So th again, this is a very similar type of uh, situation, only this time, Get random color. If you remember in our previous first example, let me hide this over here. Mm -hmm. You remember in our first example, the get PEU random color was just another function up here. Whereas this time we've taken that, let's say we found something where like, oh, there's something in PowerShell that for whatever reason, um, this was going to work better as a commandlet. Maybe it would be faster. Maybe we can utilize a library. Maybe we're doing something like we found an asynchronous interface that makes things good. You don't need to know what that is, but you'll hear it a lot in .NET. Um, and then we get to, if we look here, then that random color commandlet has been moved here. So more or less same code. If you remember that commandlet, it was just basically those quotes with that uh, PowerShell version of this syntax. This is just basically the C-sharp syntax of the exact same thing. So when we have that, then um, we can have our example here. Oh, my. Control, uh, what was it? Yeah. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Help me out. Yeah. Yeah? Hey, I, I feel pretty good. I got pretty yeah, close there. Not too bad. Is that, isn't that like Elon's kid's name right there? Yeah, that looks about right. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to take this guy and I believe as I recall, he's already built. Kill this other guy so you guys have a little more space here. Why am I, I find, do it this way. So now you're importing the manifest and the manifest points to both yeah. the PSM one and the DLL. Is that right? Yeah, so this is, again, that, that sort of hierarchy where the, uh, our manifest, and thank you for reminding that. So if we look in our, if we look in our PS1, rather than pointing directly to the, DSL, or the DLL, now we're pointing to a PowerShell module. And that PowerShell module, as its first step, loads in our additional hybrid code that we wrote and then is able to utilize it. So that's an example of how you structure that for um, being able to utilize both, um, both PowerShell code and C-sharp code in the same module. So if I got this, oh, you are going to kill me. Oh, know. question? Sorry. Yeah. With require, sorry? Uh, yeah, so you question. could. Oh, repeat. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I was really good at this until Jakob got me. Reminded us. Yeah. So yeah. Um, <laughs> So the, uh, the question is that uh, rather than doing this root module here, could you, um, ra rather than in the code there, do uh, the import the binary module, could you just come down here to the required assemblies and do it? And as you see here, we do do it there. And yes, you can do it either way. If you double import it, that's not going to hurt anything. The main reason we show doing it in the uh, PowerShell module is that there's a good reason to do that because sometimes you might want to choose based on whether you're on PowerShell 5.1 or if you're on the PowerShell 7 Plus, which DLL you want. And so this is good, but this doesn't give you as much flexibility as doing it inside the PowerShell module. Does that make sense? Sure, why not? Yeah, You, you, <laughs> right? can, you yeah. can pretty much load them anywhere. Yeah. Um, but there are some differences in, in loading order. Yeah, so what happens if you unload them? You cannot unload them. That's the issue. So PowerShell has one, um, what is it called? Uh, we have an assembly load context, and that one can be marked as collectible, but PowerShell's default assembly load context is not collectible, which means that we cannot unload the context that all the assemblies are loaded into. And, and even you cannot if, uh, unload a sim specific assembly ever. So when we load a module that is binary, because the, the module itself is a DLL file, we cannot ever unload that one. But what happens when PowerShell runs, when we run remove module on a PowerShell binary module is that it just removes everything that it knows about this thing. It removes all the commandlets, it removes all the functions, 
and, and right. stuff. But it doesn't remove the assemblies. So no, yeah, you can't. it never does. So it, if you move it, import it again in a different version, you have a conflict anyway. It is theoretically possible to do it that way, but you have to remove every reference in every piece of memory that's been using your module, which is very difficult to do. I have successfully done it, but it is, it is basically like not worth the effort. You, know, you just tell people restart their PowerShell session. So. Okay, so anyway, I was just showing an example. That's the hybrid version. This is the one where there's the PowerShell code doing it, which then calls our .NET code, which runs our C-sharp stuff, you know, and then comes back to our PowerShell code. So that's an example of a hybrid commandlet that utilizes both PowerShell because we like PowerShell and it's easy and we know how to use it, and then C-sharp for the parts where we really need to get in the weeds and we need to do something that is not necessarily PowerShell can't do because PowerShell can do a lot, but more something that um, just is either easier or makes more sense to do in C-sharp. So we are getting a little tight on time. So let's go ahead and bounce to these other examples. Those, that's the key example that we really wanted to show you is that you can write in C Sharp, you can write in PowerShell, you can do both. You have lots of options and it just becomes another tool in the toolbox just like PowerShell for writing these more advanced things that you might need to utilize. Yeah. So again, we get back to the target. Um, you're going to talk a bit about the... Uh, PS standard version of this, right? Yeah, um, this is basically the same, actually, as we did before in the PS version. We just have to make sure to target the right thing in the CS project here. So we target net standard 2.0 and we import the PowerShell standard library. Uh, but in C Sharp, we are, when we import these packages, they will not give us the same functionality as newer ones always. So we want to sometimes here, um, make sure to, to run this special code because here we don't have PS style, for example, available because it's a, it's, it needs to be compatible with older versions of PowerShell. Otherwise, it's the exact same, just we moved some of the uh, functionality to C Sharp. Uh, what I would like to talk about um, is these last three before we head off. Oh yeah, let's, let's, get into the, let's get into the weird now. Because you can write them in any .NET language, right? Yeah. So .NET is .NET, so it all compiles this thing called the Common Language Runtime. So in, in the intermediate library, which I know I'm butchering these phrases, and Jakob's over there probably cringing like crazy. But um, the uh, basically, there's a common language that everything compiles to, like a machine code kind of a thing. So whether it's written in C sharp or F sharp or whatever, it all can come down into the same aspect. And then so and they can work together. Like one can read from the other, the others can read from the others. So I wrote this. I'm a big fan of F sharp. I really like. The language, I find it really terse. I find it really uh, good. It's really good for eliminating certain errors in a certain way. And so here's an example of a PowerShell commandlet written in F sharp because I'm just importing. This should look pretty familiar to what you've seen before. There's that attribute that we talked about. I have a special output type. This is optional. I just put it in here just so that it's a way to express that my, to express in the help and to IntelliSense that this is going to output a string. And all of that is in system management automation. It's not an S yeah, F sharp yeah. thing, If you right? come back up here, uh, there's the open system management. This looks pretty familiar as to like using. It said it's open, namespace. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot less curly brackets and all that kind of stuff. It's just a little more uh, clean, for lack of a better term. And so here I have my git random command. It inherits ps commandlet. So rather than do the colon thing, it's inherit. And then I'm overriding that end processing thing. And I just let this letter equal lorem and then write object letter. So a lot less parentheses, a lot less brackets, like a little, in my opinion, a little bit easier to read. And there's some things about how F sharp works that make it really good for a lot of examples. Um, and there's random date version, same deal. This looks all should look familiar. That same get set stuff, same write object, you know, calling that method, assigning it to a variable, writing it. Can you also write this in VB? Can you? Oh no, can you? Okay. I think Ben would want us to, wouldn't he? Yeah. So we have, isn't, and there's some, I think there's somebody presenting next door who definitely told me that VB is much better than PowerShell. So I said, fine, you want your VB, here's your VB. Here's a PowerShell commandlet written in Visual Basic and ready to go. And if you don't believe me, because I don't think we have this in the solution file. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So that, .NET build, I'll make that bigger here in just a second. Got it built. Let's look in here. There's our usual bin folder. Oh my God, dear. It's gonna be the death of me. I'm gonna be more impressed if I can type it, much less if it runs. <laughs> Do you want to help typing? I, I have faith. I'm learning. Everybody's yeah. learning here. Okay, yeah. I'm learning Swedish here. They're learning .NET. It's fine. That's good. All right, so so there's that DLL put in there. It's a module import example eight DLL. 
Your minus is in the wrong place. <laughs> you are wrong and you should be wrong. Oh, what's that? Does that command work? Get, oh my god, P-E-U random letter. So close. So close. So, so much tension. Hey, look at that. Wow. So there, you got so a PowerShell works. command written in Visual Basic. Don't do that. If you're Ben, do that. So go, be sure next door when you see Ben come out of his presentation to thank him because he, he made this possible. So he also write, have, I made it possible, but it was his. We his also have the option. Thing. Also have the option of actually targeting multiple versions, which is more complex, and we can we can combine all these concepts. So we can write hybrid modules which target multiple versions of .NET. So we can target both old versions of PowerShell 5.1 and below, and we can target new versions like 7.2, etc. And then we can target both of these here, and based on different things. We can also use MS build and a lot of funky .NET syntax to do cool things during or after our publish to check like if we're using target framework net for one, then we import the net, um, well, PowerShell standard. Otherwise, if we're using net six, then we import the newer version of LTS, system management automation. And then we also have to do some stuff in the, uh, in the module file if we use a binary one, so we import the different DLLs based on the version. But I think we're basically out of time. Yep. So uh, at this point, basically, that's our presentation about the follow through. So we have some labs. In the section there are the labs. So at this point, you'll be able to do those labs go in, in your code space, just go into the, each of those labs. Um, there's a readme for the bouncer one. Otherwise, there is um, pester the test. pester test. Yeah. So if you look at the pester test, you guys are going to do what we what's called test uh, test driven development, basically, where we've written tests and we expect you to implement this. If you don't understand pester, that's fine. Again, you can just hit us up. We'll help you out with what it what it needs to do. But here's an example. These should be fairly easy to read. You know, it returns a random email. The email shouldn't be empty, and it should be a mail address. Here, you know, we want you to add a username only switch so that it only returns the username. And basically, like what we get back, we're expecting to just see the left hand side of the email address. So it shouldn't have an at symbol in it. It shouldn't have a dot in it. It shouldn't be empty. So you're going to want to write a commandlet using that lorem module that we had to implement that. So if you go to the repo in the pull requests, you'll see both the pull requests of uh, how Emmanuel did it and how I did it. All my tests pass, all his don't, but that's just because he didn't implement one. But I still take that as a nice little badge of pride. Um, Very good. So again, this is not like a test or anything like that. If you get stuck, you can go look at how we did it, or but the best is just try to figure out yourself until you get to a point where you just can't do it anymore. And if you want a hint or anything like that, or if you want to catch us in the conference, I don't have any more presentations today. So if you see me and you get stuck, you want to say, I, I can't get this part to work, I'll come sit down, I'll help you work on it. So that's our follow along presentation. Thank you all so much for coming.